I developed some languages for requirements definition where we could prove consistency, correctness, and completeness. Had one major flaw. People wouldn't use the language. And, and so we morphed into collaboration technology and decision support. And along around the end of the 90s, people started asking questions. Well, you're collecting all this data in meetings for planning. How do we know if people are lying or not, or pushing their own agenda in meetings? And that's when uh, we arranged to have Judy Burgoon come in to the CMI lab, and we started on the whole program of deception detection. And to give you some idea of the development that's gone into the avatar, probably over the last 15 years, we've had $20 million of funding for the avatar, and the group has consisted of anywhere from 25 to 35 people. So it's been a very large uh, team effort. And Mark Frank this morning uh, set a lot of the stage for the early part of my talk, so I'm going to just whiz past these and get to the avatars. So I'll just flash these. And so when we're talking about deception, these are all the ways in which we count someone as being deceptive, whether it's white lies, evasions, equivocation, etc. And we know from what Mark said, humans are not very good at doing it. Neither are professionals. And that's been pointed out a number of times when we've had as many as a couple hundred law enforcement officers, FBI, CIA, etc. And we show them videos and get the results. But the one startling fact is their assessment they proclaim is 100% accurate. Even though their accuracy may be 60%, time after time, they profess to be 100% accurate. And there's many reasons for this. There's human problems with vigilance. Uh, you look at a screener at the airport, and they're not paying attention as your bag goes through. Uh, and we've done a number of dissertations in that area. So we're looking at the ocular metrics, linguistics and vocalics, physiometrics, and kinesics. And so the avatar <clears throat> is non-invasive, non-intrusive, and no sensors in any way attached to the body. And so we use a force platform <laughs> for whether people are uh, jittery or shifting or whatever. Uh, the connect motion sensors, high definition cameras, thermal cameras, eye tracking, microphones, and of course linguistics. And all of this, based on the particular situation, 
the context. Uh, the data is moved in through a fusion engine to come up with a decision support. And so this is the fourth generation of the avatar with passport reader, fingerprint scanner, eye tracker, high definition camera, connect, microphone, and it's height adjustable because the first one was built according to my height. <laughs> and we were testing it and sure enough, one of the the groups that came through at the airport was a basketball team. <laughs> and, and so we have on the one hand uh, seven footers, yet we found a lot of people are coming through. There were about four, four foot ten inch coming in from Mexico. So that was a, a major revelation, which shouldn't have been. <clears throat> so, in coming up with the lab experiments, we had all the equipment in a lab, and we're testing it, the interviewer, and at times, the interviewer's been a polygraph examiner from the Department of Defense. And one of the things we learned was they all don't interrogate the same way, which is very important for scientific validity, how you ask the questions. Uh, and they were equally as effective at getting at the truth, but very different styles. Now you heard Matt present earlier that's Matt when he was a graduate student at Arizona. Uh, and this was our setup. And you can see the array of equipment in the lab, the thermal cameras, the laser Doppler vibrometer, etc. The idea was to take all that and put it into a form factor of a kiosk, an overgrown a ATM. And, uh, and so, this was our first version of putting it all together. And it looked like something built by an engineer with a, a director set. Uh, but we're able to get most of the equipment in and prove the functionality that it indeed performed as we thought it would. And then we moved through <clears throat> successive uh, iterations. And in one iteration, we had two screens and we realized we needed the real estate for the sec of the second screen for the fingerprint reader, passport reader, other devices. And the first three iterations were not nice and clean. I mean, they weren't designed, they kind of grew. And by the time we got to the fourth generation, it was a nice integrated package that we could swap out each unit as we needed. Uh, if somebody wanted a different fingerprint reader, we could swap it out. Big deal. <coughs> Proof of value, we've, during this time, we've run more than 8,000 subjects. Uh, through both lab and field. And I'll show you the other thing that's critically important is the embodied agent 
that's in the avatar. And whether it's a male, a female, an older male, a younger male, younger female, and which would elicit the most diagnostic responses. And that work is still going on, and there's a lot to be done in that regard. And it, it's critically important that the embodied agent, uh, and we're even looking at, as you get into an interview or an interrogation, you change and say, oh, I think I have a colleague that would be better suited to ask these questions and say, uh, Aaron will be talking to you next. And so we're looking at that. Now, I, I think it was Matt that said, uh, ground truth is so important. A and that's what we're always wrestling with. So we conducted uh, an experiment, a mock theft, uh, that was quite extensive and people would come to a building and the recorder would come on as they came into the room and said, your task, if you're willing to accept it, is to steal a ring. And it gave them instructions to go to another building and the instructions were not perfectly clear, so the anxiety was building up. And I think five or six people reported us to the police that <laughs> some kind of shady operations going on. And of course, we have cameras following them, everything they're doing. And by the way, we have a hundred terabytes of video data. So there's a lot of data for people to analyze that we haven't begun to, to mine. And so they come into the room and ask for a Mr. Carlson and the person in the room goes out to try and find them. So they get into a desk to get a key to get into a filing cabinet, pull out a box, open the box, and steal the ring. And of course, we're watching, and the minute they're taking the ring, somebody knocks on the door. And some people don't steal the ring. They leave. Uh, but those that do, they then proceed to go downstairs into the lab and go through that uh, process of being interrogated. And so this is the uh, sequence. Now, one of the other studies that we did and we've done this a number of times. And in fact, we just completed it uh, at the Reagan Airport in DC. Uh, we had people build, build a bomb. And the subjects that built the bomb, they had to assemble it. They had to put all the, the power supply, the circuit board, everything together so they knew exactly what it looked like and what would be missing if they show, were shown variations of it. So that's what they started with. And when they hooked up the power supply, the timer started going off. And people were a little jittery even though we, sh 
We assured them there was no explosive in the bomb. <laughs> and I don't know if the big... Now, what we did on the screen while they were going through the avatar, uh, we showed them an image that was different than the completed bomb. Do you see what's different about that? Yeah, there's no power supply. And so the guilty people spent more time looking at the blank part of the pipe than the innocent people. And we use their gaze duration, pupil dilation, and vocal pitch in this particular example. Uh, and we picked up, I think, 15 of the 16 border guards that had packed a pipe, that had packed the pipe bomb. We also ran the test uh, in uh, Gallus, Arizona for the Sentry program. And uh, <clears throat> one of the lessons we learned, uh, the avatar spoke perfect Spanish. Well, guess what? The people crossing the border didn't understand perfect Spanish, <laughs> Castilian Spanish. They had a mixture of border Spanish, Spanglish. And so we had to uh, train the avatar in, uh, at about the fifth grade level instead of 12th grade Spanish. I'm done. And we had Alan Burson give the, uh, he was the commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, and he happened to be there at the day we we're introducing the avatar. And so we've, we've done the avatar at the border at the Romanian airport, and what we're going to be doing <clears throat> In Singapore, they're looking at, can you build a holographic avatar that will go up and down the line looking at people coming into the country? So, thank you. <clears throat>